Hello everyone, and I'm Gary Lin from the Suzhou Taipei office. So I'm working for the I working in the department uh, Suzhou Labs is a it's a department man mainly for the kernel development, but I am probably like the uh, Max is also in Suzhou Lab, but we are probably not in, involved in kernel that much. And I mainly involved in the uh, UEFI is a uh, uh, firmware now is popular in common computers. So and so my basically I working more more on the bloaters. So today I want to share with the with you guys in the experience I how I developing uh, those programs. And so let's start. So UEFI, so what is UEFI? And this is my today today topic. So it stands for uh, unified extensible firmware in place. So from the net you can see it's a firmware interface. So uh, the how there's a firmware uh, to control the, the the hardware and the UEFI is defined by defined a series of protocol, digital protocol. And so the operating system can call those protocol or the broader also can call those protocol to uh, operate with the uh, the firmware. So we can access the like uh, the some resource. So we can like memory table. We can uh, ask the firmware to return a, a complete memory table or like a draw, or even draw something on the screen. You can call the protocol to do that. And from the old, always uh, always vendor the post of view and the more like this. Uh, so when when the computer starts, the CPU will load, will start to execute the the, the code in the flash ROM and. Uh, in in, more, in the more modern computers, you see that there's a UEFI in, in the in a fresh run, so you start to uh, run the, the code in the, uh, you start to run UEFI in the beginning, and UEFI will then later will load the broader, and the broader will load the the, the, the Linux kernel, so we can start uh, uh, open source. And my job is more focused on the broader this way these things. So, and yeah, and what what makes the uh, UEFI so special is uh, that is because there's a uh, open source reference project. It's called the EDK, EDK2. Uh, in the old days, like a BIOS time, uh, the BIOS vendor always keep their code as a proprietary software, and uh, normal user you cannot access the code because they is their, their property and they, they will not release to you guys so you cannot even modify or do anything you want but now UEFI they, they change uh, some kind of strategy and so uh, they it's, it's also actually led by the Intel and uh, they maybe they want everyone to start to involve uh, the firmware development so they start this project and it's called EDK2 and it's a BSD license the, is a, uh, the EDK2 is a BSD license, so uh, basically you can take a code to do whatever you want. There's no many restriction, and so nowadays the the, the, the new the modern computer you are using even the server, the laptop, or the desktop, they were using the uh, the firmware based on EDK2 and add, add some maybe their their own uh, network driver or the the VGA driver. But basically, they are using the same code base, and so the, the best thing is you, uh, the the whole the whole firmware is not a black box anymore, and so uh, you you can just look into the source code and know how it works, and from the very very beginning of the, the computer, I mean, in in the yeah in the old days, you know that there's some kind of a, a interrupt or something, and so you can call the browser to do that, but. Nowadays, you can just re look into the source code and uh, know how it works. And it's, uh, and this project is also the C language best, so not assembly code anymore. And it's a more e easier to read and also easier to fix the bugs. And it also the module uh, it also has a module design. Um, so you you can so nowadays the firmware vendor just checks uh, just checks that several. Uh, it, I mean, there, there are a lot of modules in the whole whole project, and uh, the firm, the firmware vendor just have to check which which module they have to use, and uh, so they don't have to 
we design or, or everything is just checking uh, checking all those those things they need. And also it supports a lot of different architectures. So the normal normal architecture like the SXD6 and is also already support. And even the discontinued the IA64. And so now nowadays the ARM and the ARC ARC64 are also very popular. So it's also support those two kind of uh, architecture. And this year, there's a new, there's a guy from HP, I remember, he started working on the risk v And it's a, it's an architecture for kind of open, open hardware and from, like a, I remember from Berkeley or some, somewhere else. But uh, it's a, more like an experience, it's a mental uh, architecture, but they you also port it to uh, EDK2. So, so EDK2 uh, is it's also uh, it's compared. That, I mean, there, there, there's a UEFI part spec, and EDK2 is following the UEFI spec. So it's basically every uh, released every year. So on average, I mean, uh, not 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 really every year has a new release, but averagely uh, there there will be a new release every every year. And because uh, they they will define the spec first and the UEFI and then the EDK2 start to implement those new features or the fixed on bugs. And so now comes now here here comes the question that uh, how uh, how how we to follow up those the new features or the bug fixing because uh, if we if we have to wait the firmware vendor fix the the new the bugs or uh, release the new new firmware for the feature, then we have to wait uh, maybe several months and uh, after the, the the firmware was released because they have uh, their own release cycle and uh, they takes quite a long time. So yeah, so this is my, so this is the first, uh, uh, first challenge I met when I was working on the UEFI because uh, I, I was started as the secure boot and uh, at that time, that there's no, no no shipping machine has this this kind of function. So I have, I have to find a way to test my code, so to make sure my, my code is really works. So there are three actually three different. You have three options. So the first is that you can buy a Intel UEFI development kit, and you can buy it online, but it takes around uh, fourteen hundred US dollars. And you also will probably you will need a pro you know, programmer like a daily daily program. It's an entry level programmer. SF one hundred is a it's also takes around uh, two hundred and thirty dollars. So if if you, if you start with this, then uh, you report to your boss and say, hey, boss, I want uh, some like sixteen hundred dollars. And your boss starts start to ask you why you need this money and uh, yeah you. They, 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 they never ask you, yeah, and they will say, maybe your boss will say, oh, we don't have this, this budget, so we have to wait, and uh, even you have money you have to, to buy it online and uh, to try to wait the shipping, shipping time. Anyway, and, but the, the, best, the best thing of the, this, this, uh, this development kit is uh, it's, it's supported by Intel, and uh, if, you, if you buy a daily blog, uh, uh, SF100, uh, Programming time is about 15 seconds. Uh, it's uh, quite fast enough, but the the cost is a problem. So you can so you, you, if you keep finding it, you you find another solution. You can you can find a mino bolt tur turbo. It's a more like an embedded bolt and uh, it's a smaller and cheaper. So you can see it only costs around uh, $140, just one, one digit less than the previous one. So your boss will be very happy, and uh, even even programmer is cheaper because you don't need to buy a the like, like a data prod or SF100 because uh, there's another one called SPI book, and uh, this one only costs twenty nine dollars, so much cheaper than previous one. Then, but the but the down the, the drawback is that you the programming time is quite long. You maybe take a few less than a few five minutes, but still a few minutes compared to fifteen seconds. It's still a drawback, and uh, yeah, it's it's save money, but it, uh, it, you have to wait waste your time. 
So here comes the third solution, and this is something I'm using. It's actually a virtual machine. So just using the QEMU and the Odin app is a special framework for the for all the QEMU. And the, because it's a virtual machine, so basically it costs nothing. And the programmer, you don't really need a programmer. Uh, you just copy the file and uh, or specify the, the path to the file. So it's a cost of nothing. And the program time is just copy the file. So it's, uh, it's maybe less than 0 0.1 second. So compared to previous one, it's a comparison table. So you can see all, all those costs and the, the program time. You can see we got winner. It's a virtual machine. <laughs> and so this is why I'm using this, or this to develop the UEFI things because it costs nothing and uh, very fast. Why, why I'm not used it? So then how I use the virtual machine and uh, UEFI and, uh, and it's a uh, QEMU and uh, OpenF. So oh, QEMU uh, is quite a stable project and uh, you just download the latest one from the website and you can even just zipper in and QEMU and uh, you start to install it. And so I want to introduce the Bobbing app. Uh, it's a kind of a special firmware. So the, the name is open, open, virtual, open Virtual Machine Firmware. So from the name, you know it's a firmware for, for the virtual machine, just for the virtual machine. So the best thing is that it's a part of EDK to sub project. So, uh, so it used, uh, basically used uh, a lot of code in EDK2. So this means you are using the code that the firmware vendor you uh, they, they are also using the same code. So they, they, you can make sure you uh, it's work uh, for the most most of the functions works as uh, other firmware vendors. So if you fix something in in OVF, then usually it can apply to other other uh, 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 if if, if uh, it's a shared shared part, and it means if your code maybe be tricked in into the uh, the the EDK2 upstream then other firmware vendors also apply your fix. So here's how I build the firmware. Uh, it's a not, not so complicated as a, a build, build script for you. And so just uh, check out the clone, the, the source code from the, the website, the, from the GitHub. So and uh, you, you, can, you can just use the, the, the build script in the OBM PK3. And, but you have to, but there's a small tip for the DIP42 and 42.1 and the Tumbleweed. Uh, because 42.1 is using the GCC 4.8, 4, 4, 4 so there are some features that the build screen is not really support. So, yeah, you don't, uh, so you, you use the, uh, you don't have to specify the, the, the ta build target, just uh, long, long script. And, but if you're using the Tumbleweed, then you can specify the GCC file as a build target. So you can apply some new GCC feature like the LTO. So the, uh, the, the restore image will be smaller and the code might be faster because it, it's a, a LTO is kind of a, a techni uh, technology to optimize the, the core size and the, the speed. So you can just enable it to run the, to make it faster. So after you, you build, uh, after you, you run the build screen, then uh, there, there will be two, two files you have to know. So one is the OVF code uh, .fd and OVF OVF uh, bars .fd. And those two parts are, the, the code is the, yeah, as, as the name is the code, and the, the, the bars is the bar store. So, in, in the firmware, there are two parts. Uh, so the one part is the, for the code. So, uh, so this this part is read only, and the other part is the bus store. Bus store is the a space uh, in in the fresh ROM, and so you can write something into the, the bus store and uh, store your data in in, in the bus store. So this is very important because uh, like uh, your all your configuration for your your, your firmware will store in the bar. Bus store. So if you don't have the bus store, then every time you put in your your, your firmware, then the, everything you have to do is again, and this is inconvenient. 
and there are a lot of build, different build options. So like uh, the Secure Boot is the first one I, I'm using, and it requires you to download uh, OpenSSL, and and you have to follow some instruction in, inside uh, how to to in in uh, in, uh, in, in the directory, and there's a how to and tell you how to apply the uh, uh, it's a special patch for for OpenSSL, and there there are some other like the network IP IP6 is enabled the IPv6 stack, and or HTTP boot HTTP boot, and this is a very new feature and. Uh, Probably, would, probably they would, uh, it will be improving the machine releasing this year or maybe next year. And the other, like SSM required, is uh, more like a security feature. And the CSM enable is uh, to, uh, to make you able to use the like uh, legacy files. But usually, I don't use it because uh, QEMU is already include the C files and it's, uh, the legacy files, so I don't really need it. So, but actually, you don't have to do all this problem because I already package the package the OBM for you guys. And if you really want to use it, you just zip it in, and the OBM queue me will be for S eighty six sixty four, and that's it. And you download download the the package and just install it. So you they they are uh, you will install a lot of different files. So. For the code, code part, and there are several parts. Yeah, actually, there are several different different uh, codes of uh, flavors, like the uh, NS source and open source. And actually, the most of part, of those four files are the same. The only difference is uh, uh, the the key for the secure boot. And if you if you don't 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 care about secure boot, then you just use the first one. The just use the first one, the S86 code, and it's enough for you. And the bar, the, I also uh, create several files for the bars. And actually, those four files are the same, so just choose it, uh, choose one you would like. And for any other information, you can just check with readme. And I re I, re uh, I write, write everything I know into the readme, so you can like uh, how to start the virtual machine and the how to set up some like a debug, uh, debug uh, uh, source label debugging, and you can just check it, uh, check this file. Okay, so I want to show you how I set up a very simple test environment. So in the beginning, you have to uh, make sure you can. Your your bar store can be right, so I usually copy the, the file from from the USR share to somewhere else. I, I have a right access, and uh, I also will create a, a special directory called the uh, HDA contents, and I'll mention later in in, in in this this comment. So in the QNIST system, you can see. I enable the tag in uh, this uh, accessory so accessory so I enable it and uh, this is for the uh, for memory size. So you can see here here's the one important for the uh, OBF. You have to specify the it's a pfresh format and the raw and it's read really only for, for the code part, so you have to specify it's a read really only part. And uh, for the for the bar story because it's uh, in some way I can write so I didn't append the read-only tag, so it's, a, it's, it's writable. And you can see here, I, uh, I specify the uh, uh, HDA contents as a, as a fate, as a fate, fate partition. So this is a very uh, convenient trick, because if, if usually using a, a virtual machine, you have to create a virtual disk. And, uh, if you want to copy anything into a virtual disk, maybe you have to use like a uh, QEMU uh, BDN or something, and, or to just open or just uh, uh, start the operating system inside the, the disk. But if you create uh, like uh, the, this HDA com contents and space, and just using this command to to simulate uh, a fed the F80 partition, and you can just copy everything into the, the directory, and the, the virtual machine can just use those files immediately. Okay. 
So if you do every, everything right, then you will see this. This is how it starts, and then you see the TNR code is the, the, is the name. So if you see this screen, that means you, you do everything right. So, okay. so now I start to share I, some, how, some debugging tips. Uh, because if you, if you want to develop everything in UEFI, then you may need to debug your, your program. So there are basically two, two parts I have want to share. So the first part is the, the debugging law. Uh, actually, uh, you can direct, actually the UEFI, the, the OPNF is provide a lot of debug message, but you have to save it. In, it save a lot of message in, in some, somewhere else. And so this is the, this is the command to, to save uh, all the debug message into uh, the file. So you can check it uh, immediately or make check it later. If you crash it somewhere else, then you can check it into the, the debug log. So you may have some idea why, why it's crash or where it's crash. And, yeah. and so usually I will use the tail dash f for the for the for the log file, so I can I, I can check the the debug message immediately. And also, you can doing some source label debugging. So it means you can attach the GDB into the virtual machine and <coughs> just using like like a step by step or let's say some, some like a breakpoint. So uh, you can just trace the whole everything in in, in source and the uh, life. And I already packaging everything as a, a debug a debug uh, package, so we just need to install the debug package. And uh, but it's a little bit complicated because uh, you have to specify, you, you have to add a lot of GDB commands, and lo those thing, lo lo uh, those commands I already uh, uh, I already write into the, the remix. So if you really want have an interesting in in the source label debugging, you can you can just copy all those all those commands from the readme and uh, into the GDB and you can start to use it. And this is how I, I do it because I, I don't want to mem memorize all those things. So the um, okay. next thing is uh, HTTP boot and uh, I want to share with you how I developing uh, the program about HTTP boot. Um, so HTTP is a, I, I just mentioned it's a new function uh, added to the uh, UEFI recent in the recent years. So okay. so it's a it was added into the, the spec since the UEFI 2.5 is released uh, last year and this year the, the spec was released last year and uh, this year is 2.6. Uh, it's also add some improve, improvement. So. But nowadays, there's no no machine, uh, no no shipping machine has this function. So I have to I have to find a way to test it. And actually, when I was working on that, um, uh, some some uh, the, the the network stack is still not complete. So uh, I actually help uh, the EDK two to EDK two project to debugging some to fix something in, in EDK two. So. I also, I, I, although I'm working on in, in, in uh, OS vendor, and uh, actually I fix bug in the firmware. So it get two, and you can call it a beta PC boot. And so you, in in old days, uh, there's a bit, uh, networking boot we call it PC boot, but nowadays we, uh, they they find some some strain, uh, some restriction and uh, some drawback in the PC boot, so they want to replace it in with the HTTP boot, but actually it's more than just PC boot. And so uh, in, in old days, you want, want to uh, remote install a, a client, like uh, this one, then you have to set up three different uh, servers. <laughs> the first is a DFC server, and the second is a TFTP, and uh, then you have to set up a HTTP or FTP server. And TFTP server is kind of a slow server. It's not really good for transmitting uh, the big files. So 
usually you, you will set up every, uh, you will transmit the, the large file in the FTP or FTP server. So in the beginning, the, the DHCP server, uh, the client will request the, the, the IP from the DHCP server, and the DHCP server will reply the, the assigned IP, to, IP address to the client, and uh, also tell, tell the client where is the, the, the last stage broader, the location of broader. So the, when the broader found there's a bro, when the client found there's a broader in the TFTP server, they will start to download the broader from the from the TFT, uh, TFTP server. Then after uh, it's put into the broader, then broader will do everything from the HTTP or FTP server. So as you can see, actually TFTP and HTTP they are doing very the same thing, just just make files. But TFTP is slow and uh, maybe has some restriction in the, for, for the local, uh, lo local network area. And maybe you can now just pass the, the, the internet, so it's uh, some restriction. So now the HTTP boot is more like this. Uh, you only need a DHCP server and the HTTP, HTTP server. And so it's uh, much the same as before, just uh, request IP and the, the boot put all the location from the DHCP server and uh, do everything from the HTTP server. And that, uh, it, it looks very simple, but there are some very complicated things in, in the firmware because you have to implement all the HTTP stake and uh, uh, some other, like the, but now, now they, all, they also implement some security features to make sure you can cross the whole internet. So, it's actually more, much more complicated than the PC, but PC is just more like a transmit or UDP, TCP, and that's enough. But for the HTTP, there are a lot of things to do. So uh, until now, they, they really did it. And actually, they are, they are something more than just download the broad and everything like this. Uh, HTTP, there are some, there are another thing is to allow you to download the uh, the remote ISO image from directly from the, the HTTP server. Uh, that means you don't if you just maybe type in the the URL of the ISO in, in your firmware, not in, in the browser, and you will just download the, the ISO file to your to your client, to your, your computer, and later you just start to use the ISO as a, maybe like a virtual CD or virtual disk and uh, to start to use the, the, the ISO, the file to install everything. And this part is actually doesn't, uh, the broader doesn't matter and uh, Joey, Joey fixed the, uh, Joey, Joey uh, developed a, a, a driver for, for Linux kernel so we can support this, this scheme. And now it seems it works for uh, uh, space, uh, SUSE enterprise so I, I think it also works on the open source for the 42.2, yeah. Okay, so going to the work. Okay, so if I want to then test the HTTP boot, then that means I have to step out the network environment. So that that's a uh, that's a very important. You have to step out the, the network the networking VM. So then now I will share how I set up a networking VM. Actually, you have two choices. The first is you can set up just an isolated network. And so uh, I create a, a, a virtual, a virtual uh, interface, network interface called TAP0, and there was a you know, time control. And so, so the idea is that I, I also create a, I create a virtual machine to connect to the host with the, the virtual network interface. So my host can also be a server. And I don't need to stay, set up another machine to be a server. My host can be a server. And uh, my virtual, uh, my, in the virtual machine, it's just a be a client. So it's just connect to each other. And so I don't have to set up uh, too many machines, just one host, one machine. And later I will, demo I will demonstrate uh, this kind of uh, this is kind of an uh, environment. So it's quite kind of easy. It's just create a user time control, create an interface, and uh, then 
start to and start uh, the giving you with the some special commands like the you have specified the tab, tab device and uh, the interface the tab zero I just created. And there's one thing very important is you have to disable the wrong wrong file. Uh, because the, by default you will load the, the wrong file and then from the the, uh, the virtual networking networking card and the the card the wrong file contains the uh, IPC and IPC uh, I, I think it is the content is the own implementation of HTTP boot. And all I want to uh, to test is the HTTP boot in the OpenF. So I have to disable the IPC before I start the whole networking. And so maybe your networking may be too complicated and uh, you, you don't want to just simulate the, your networking with the very sim this kind of simple environment. And you can also you can also doing a a connected uh, uh, virtual virtual machine. So the idea is very similar, and also create a tab zero. But there's a difference. I use the bridge to bridge the, the tab zero to the maybe the physical physical interface like the ETH zero, ETH zero, and uh, use the ETH zero to connect to the to your networking, to your network, and uh, maybe maybe you set up your your network, uh, your server in, in somewhere else, so you can test uh, some very complicated environments. And it's very similar as uh, the isolated virtual machine, and just, but you have to create a, a bridge, and to, to bridge the tab zero and the ETH zero together, so they can connect together and transmit the, 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 pack, the packets. So the other is pretty much the same as before and just use the, the same the same command needs to work for you. Okay, so then I can show you some demo. So here's a, a very simple program, it's, uh, just print the hello world and uh, in, 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 it's a, in, in, in a EFI file. So then I can make it. I copy the file to the, to the directory I create is uh, HDA contents, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a simulate uh, the F A T partition. So then I start my virtual machine with a sweep. Okay. Then you go into a shell. So similar to the to the Linux shell. So you can just type some. You can see the hello world is here, and uh, I just there you can see the uh, too small, uh, but this in here is a hello world print, and okay then later I change it to yeah hello Jujia. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I change something and uh, I I just have to copy the file and make. To recompile the file and uh, copy the file to to there. And <coughs> can see, yeah, we can hello to Jack. So I I don't have to copy a file around the machine and just. Yeah, just just copy just copy the file to the directory and then everything was done. And yeah. It's a more convenient. Uh, and okay, as I say I can show you the HTTP boot. But
I use the DNS mask as the DHCP, <coughs> DHCP server so I can monitor the, the status of it. And I also start the virtual machine. Here's a HTTP v4, there's an entry. And so if I call this, then, okay. If I call, call the, the, if I press the entry, then it will start to using HTTP. And one very wonderful thing is I can, I can just more than everything just in several terminals. So I can use the TCP dump on the tab zero so I can know every packet on it. Hello, I want to ask about PXE. Oh, my name is Igno. Uh, I want to ask about PXE boot, especially HTTP boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, doesn't that add a security risk, especially when somebody can put your system uh -huh. without physically in there? Uh, uh, it's more like another question because uh, if you want to protect your firmware, you can just add a password for your firmware. Uh -huh. So you, nobody can can add a, a strange URL into your firmware. And uh -huh. maybe and also if you put into the if, if you already put into the operating system, then the, you can have to make sure nobody have the the root access. So if the, if someone malicious has the root access, then can create a, a malicious URL as a branch tree, so the firmware may be going to the, the branch tree. So more like the, yes, yes, it is possible to to download any malicious thing from remotely, but it's more like you have to protect it in another way. So, yeah. Yes, thank you. Very uh, great. Satisfying. Thank you. Yeah, terima kasih. Yang kedua, yang belakang tidak bertanya ya? Hello. Yeah. My name is Tiara Nifari. Oh, I have a question for you uh, about UFI. Uh, what is the use of UFI? And then UFI was developed uh, using uh, any language? Any language? Yeah, any, any language? You mean how how is it implement the UFI? Uh, uh, for back end developer. Uh, <laughs> you mean for, for how to implement the UFI? It's a C language. Uh, it's a C language. Uh, most of parts is a C language, and uh, some very, very beginning code is in assembly code. But it's a, just a very small portion of the code is the assembly code. The other, most of part are, are C, C languages. So it's easier to understand. Yeah, not, not like assembly code. Okay, you can see it. 
Oh enggak, nanti tanya emailnya apa Facebook, Facebook aja nanti ada You can have Facebook account, right? Jerry? Do you have Facebook account? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Facebook account Oke, okay. ada dua penanya uh, Silahkan ke depan untuk memperoleh bingkisan Ya, ada dua Tanya lagi boleh, silahkan uh, Any other question, right? It's okay, ya? Ya, silahkan uh, Hello, my name is Harris uh, I just wondering that uh, It's possible for us to put some logo or picture in UFI I mean, uh, I was wondering using a play mode is not reliable right now because our computer right now is so fast. So using play mode is, I think, useless right now. But I still want to show some logo, for example, the Kiko logo when we put in Weaver. It's possible uh, or not? And the, se the second as question, it's possible to use Weaver in our device? Yeah. Yeah. And so the first question is, uh, can can you change the logo of UEFI? Just okay. put the logo so on the picture. It depends on if you have the source code, and of course you can do it. But you usually, I mean, you, you, you find, find the, the, the data from, um, from a vendor, usually they, they don't open the source code for you. And although it's based on the EDK2, but you still need some very special, like the proprietary networking driver or some star code from like from where code from the, the, the vendor. It's a more like a closer source part. So uh, so theoretically you can do everything on UEFI but nowadays not, not every people they release everything. So if you they, they, they release something like the mean the mean logo you can do everything on it. Uh, yeah so you can just change the logo whatever you want but for other vendors it depends on if you, if they release the their code part. Yeah, and uh, the second question is uh, if, if it's on um, support ARM or like uh, ARM64, yes, it's always support. And uh, actually, nowadays, the ARM64 machine, a lot of are using the server machine, they are using UEFI, the server machine. But the, for, for the consumer device, maybe it's not still using uh, the, 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 like uh, the or call it U-boot or something else. Yeah, I think U-boot is more popular in the consumer device. But for the server, I, as far as I know, the S, uh, ARM64 uh, yeah, is already using UEFI. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Kita bisa menginputkan kalau kita punya source code untuk mengganti logonya ya. Dua pertanyaannya bisa dipakai untuk ke ARM. Ada pertanyaan lagi? Masih ada waktu ya Mas ya? Masih? Berapa menit di situ? Kan ada beberapa jam di situ jamnya. Empat sampai jam empat puluh. Lebih empat puluh. Masih sepuluh menit? Oke masih sepuluh menit. Ada lagi pertanyaan? Atau kita minta demo yang lain gitu. Bisa pakai ini demo for us? Do you have any demo for us? No. Maybe with online using your cloud, maybe to install no. <laughs> some OS. Uh, I didn't prepare that far, and uh, my laptop is not so powerful, so okay. <laughs> it's not possible now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.